All right. Thanks, guys, for coming and having this second discussion on uh, miracles. Um, I thought I'd just start by a sort of quick recap of the situation, and then I think the arguments will flow fairly quickly. So last time we talked, especially towards the end of the conversation, when sadly my internet ran out, but <laughs> you two guys were able to reach uh, an interesting point where you had established a kind of continuity between the emergence that we see in nature and the kinds of miracles that Christ was doing. Um, and then John raised the good point of, but why do we need God then? Like if we can explain miracles using, let's say the emergence that we see within nature, then what, like, why do we need to bring something that is somehow beyond nature? And it's to try and address this that I wrote, uh, actually the last two articles I wrote, but especially the, the last one. Mm -hmm. During the last discussion, John, you brought up the fact that you know, historically, the, the need for something beyond nature in miracles showed up. You, you could see like the debate in the late Renaissance between uh, some like so, some Neoplatonists and Christians and like Cartesians on the one side and like this debate. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I tried to look into it, but I didn't quite find something I could really sink my teeth into because it like there was so much like political issues uh, like in yeah. between the metaphysical debates that it was hard for me to decipher. But over time, after looking into Christological issues, I found something where definitely like we need to, to draw a line uh, where like we definitely need to go beyond what we see uh, within the naturalist worldview, uh, at least typically, uh, namely the incarnation. So I, I tried to therefore write something where I could stay as close as possible to the kinds of metaphysics that John, you've been defending uh, in this corner of the internet, while still, you know, being able to like make my way as close as possible to the incarnation and like say clearly like where we, we depart. So I can try to summarize this briefly. I know you've both read the article, so I won't try yep. to go into tons and tons of details. Excellent but... article, excellent article. Thank you, that means a lot. Um, and yeah, I'll try to just su summarize and then uh, you can both uh, respond. So the basic idea was at the ground of, uh, at the ground of really, uh, there, there is possibility at the ground of being that gets shaped by the ground of intelligibility. There are constraints on nature. Uh, mm -hmm. And we see these constraints at different layers. Like there are constraints in the basic laws of physics that constrain the emergence of particles at the bottom of physics, for instance. Mm -hmm. There are other uh, constraints that show up, let's say, uh, at the level of our uh, consciousness, which will shape the emergence like uh, from our neurons in our body in an environment. Uh, and then there are higher level constraints still, for instance, the, the kinds of uh, social level constraints that we mentioned last time when we talked about mm -hmm. the placebo effect, for instance, that will shape the emergence of like healings and other things. Um, and I tried to use this basic idea that the, the, there's a locus, there's a ground of intelligibility that shaped things uh, and try to get it as close as possible to where I could with like the incarnation. So mm -hmm. I start with the logos at the bottom of things. And then I, I try to explain how the logos can act through human intellect. And that's mm -hmm. kind of an old Platonic idea where mm -hmm. let's say if uh, I'm, in the example, I use the example of uh, an engineer doing mathematics. If, if you're I just doing- I want to interject yep. to let people know that uh, within mathematics, Platonism is a respected, even a prominent position. So you're not, you're not shuffling in something from the bottom of the deck here in any way, just to strengthen your, yep. your argument actually. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. and because it works because in mathematics like the truths we're dealing with are so abstract they, they let's say if you take the Pythagorean theorem or any other kind of mathematical truth you end up with something that would be true even if time and space themselves didn't exist like you're dealing with some some very very abstract level of reality and humans can mediate between that abstract layer of reality and concrete reality if i'm an engineer and i i do mathematics and i use the, this abs very abstract relationship to create something then this very abstract mathematical relationship will end up shaping the world through me. So you can see this as the, the logos, the ground of intelligibility acting through human intellects to shape reality. It's, it's a, the, the old biblical idea of uh, it's Adam mediating between heaven and earth. Okay, so that's where I, I, I go to then. And then the, the step I try to make, which goes uh, further is to say how the incarnation goes further than this typical case of humans be mediating between heaven and earth, where uh, I want that in the case of the incarnation, rather than having, let's say, just 
sporadic uh, actions of the logos through human intellects that happen here and there when we engage in like this or that activity, that in the case of uh, the human nature of Christ, you see a hypostatic union, to use the precise term, you see a union in one person where the logos is constantly acting through like irreducibly the human nature of Jesus. And then you get this picture where throughout all of the development of nature, and I use Bergson there uh, and his idea of how it is that you can see in evolution, the apparition of more and more free kinds of life, uh, like life forms that are able to be shaped, let's see, more and more abstractly by the logos. So they have more like, possibilities open to them. Yes, 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 yes. Maybe, yes. maybe that's a better way of putting it because it's more consistent with the premises of your previous argument. If you'll just allow me to interject there. Yeah. I'm just yeah, trying yeah, to help yeah. you out. I'm just yeah, trying to help yeah. you out right now. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. Thank you. That's how I, I wrote it in the article. It yeah. didn't come back to me quickly enough. But yes, that's right. So we, we have, let's say humans, we have a lot more possibility than animals and animals have still more possibility than plants, which have mm -hmm. still more possibilities than uh, minerals, for instance. But it's this fact that we humans have more possibility, which means that like the logos can shape, let's say the bottom layer of physics, like can shape the ground of, of uh, can shape the possibility of the ground of being, the logos can then shape possibility through human intellect. And I want to say that then what happens, what is different from what we see in nature, like currently we don't see humans that are getting shaped like every instant by the, the logos directly. We, we see people who have like glimpses, uh, but the claim for the incarnation would be, okay, at this point, we have something different where the human nature always offers its potential to be shaped by the logos directly. Uh, and you have this cooperation then where the logos is always acting through the human nature of Jesus. So that's where I, I, I read the fair amount of Christology to try and make sure that I wouldn't say any heresy there. But I think that, <laughs> so on the one end, I'm sort of trying to stretch what I can see from within your language, John. Uh, and uh, on I, the I, other I, end, I really respect and appreciate that. I just want to do something else yep. to help you out just yeah, for viewers. You. When JP is using the term intellect, he's not using it the way we currently use it today, as we would when we're talking about an intellectual. He's using it in more of the ancient Neoplatonic Greek sense, which is our capacity to grasp, you know, abstract and profound patterns. Um, and so it's not the same uh, 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 it's, it overlaps, but it, we shouldn't hear just that sense of intellect that we use in the world today. So, for example, and JP mentions this in his, uh, in his article, an artist who renders some beautiful music or some great work of art is also demonstrating nous, is also demonstrating intellect in that sense. And so the platonic sense of intellect is much broader than our current sense. And so I want to emphasize that because what JP is saying here isn't sort of, uh, I don't want it to be thought of it as just sort of a purely conceptual thing that's happening. Some of his examples, like the mathematician, and he and, I, and JP, I believe, does that for good reason, because as I said, uh, Platonism within math is a well-respected position within mathematics. But if we, if we go back to the original meaning, it's much more, it is much more comprehensive of our humanity than our current word intellect would indicate. And I think that's also needed to just again to strengthen the, the argument you're making, JP. So I just wanted to put that in there. Yes, thank you. And then what I'm ultimately trying to, to do with this is sort of a, a top down move where I'm trying to do metaphysics and to see how I can bring in the logos through human intellects. And then on the other end, I would sort of try to plug this in with what we discussed last time especially as I said earlier, the point where you two guys got to, to when, I, uh, when I lost my internet connection, where you, we want to say that on the one end, the, the miracles, like the events that happen within Christ's lives are, uh, are within Christ's life, sorry, are events which are higher levels of emergence from what we see in nature. They're kind of weird events that explain the, the other, the multiplicity of weird events that we see within nature. So I sort of try to get this bottom up move from like emergence up until like the nature, the human nature of Christ. But I also try to get the top down move from the logos through that human nature of Christ. So hopefully I get to like say, okay, this is the point where I have to break from the kind of naturalism that mm. I think Johnny would be comfortable with, but like at least now it's clear. So um, that, that's my basic idea. And you, and you, and you tried to argue, I mean, you acknowledge that. And again, thank you for that. That was, that was charitable. On you on your part um, and, and i want to say it, it, for anybody who reads the articles i put a comment in 
uh, when JP says John would agree with this, John would agree, he's right, he's, he's getting it correct. And so he's not misrepresenting me in any way. Um, uh, but then you said, you know, the argument sort of stops here, but you at least want to propose something that's in continuity. And I, I really liked the metaphor, I want to explore it with you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, differences of degree become differences in kind. We talked about that last time. And then this idea of a new kind of life, right? Almost the way, you know, we have, you know, uh, intelligent life emerging out of non-intelligent life. You're proposing something at least analogous to that. It, it, am I understanding you correct? Yes, yes, that's correct, yes. Okay, and I, I, that, that topic, and, and again, um, I see and the, the move you made at the end there just to strengthen. I mean, you, you argued last time that at the core of C.S. Lewis's argument, right, is that the incarnation is the, is, the, is the greatest miracle that makes the other miracles possible. And therefore, I think zeroing in on the incarnation here was actually, you know, a completely legitimate move. Um, um, so right now, I just want to make sure that, you know, you, you, that, you, that I, I'm fully appreciating your argument and seeing it in, in the strongest possible fashion. Yeah, thank you. I don't know if you guys want to respond right away. I know you also mentioned Nishitani in your uh, in your comment, John. And I, I ended up reading the book after your comment because it has really piqued my, my interest. And Which what uh, religion and nothingness? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, well, the, uh, I, I I do have some things to say on the basis yep. of that. Yep. Um, but I I mean I kind of want to hear Paul's initial reactions yep. first, right? Um, just like you allowed me the chance to say how I was receiving it. I'd like to hear how Paul is receiving it before I respond, because I want, I want this to be as inclusive as possible. I, I don't mind just watching too, but I, I, I love the paper. I thought it was um, a couple moments, you know, my Protestant formation got tweaked a little bit, but <laughs> I, I think, you know, I think the, you know, I really loved the previous conversation we had and I thought it, took some surprising and delightful turns. Um, you know, I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, JP, that you lost your internet connection, but the, the end of the conversation was, was quite interesting. Lewis, you know, when, when you, you know, when I, when I look at how you mapped it out, I really love the way you mapped it out. And I'm, I think it's exactly right that you focused on the incarnation because Lewis and miracles very much sees, so nature is our sister God is not within the system of nature. God, of course, is the, is the source and the author of nature. And humanity is, is a sibling to nature, but also, you know, we are the stuff of earth and the breath of God. So humanity is, is sort of this, this weird amphibian creature that is, that is not fully natural. And we we continue to bear witness to this position whenever we use words like, um, you know, human, you know, man-made climate change as if that is unnatural. I mean, and that's a persistent relic of our language that we have. And it's, it's interesting then the, how the logos comes in, in terms of a mission in order to, because the idea is that humanity, humanity rebelled and so lost its, its comfortable relationship with its sister nature and lost its communion with its source for at least half of its being. So in, in that way for Lewis, human beings are also sort of a, you know, a union between nature and God in his book, Miracles. And so I thought the way you laid things out is was exactly was very fair to Lewis's book, and I think it and I think it anticipates then what what we talk about in terms of miracles here that there is somehow with um, somehow with the how to phrase this with the power of the author nature is capable of things that the sister alone doesn't is incapable of and i thought you you really illustrated that beautifully in terms of math and the engineer that you know what what we find with human engineers is this capacity you know human engineers pull from nature a capacity 
to do things that we don't find naturally occurring. And so I thought your paper was dead on faithful to Lewis's work. And I thought it, I found it very comfortable in terms of my own framing of the world, given the uh, influence that Lewis has had on me. Thank you. Yeah, that makes me want to bring out another point that I think I should have brought in my summary, namely that in the, the logos constraining possibility since like, the Big Bang, basically, you see like the logos coming to greater and greater expression where like, and, and you can see this in Nishitani as well, where yep. like we, let's say, it's especially clear in humans, we can bring out more of the logos than animals or plants can, for instance. And the idea that, John, you, you brought up earlier as well, that I mentioned that then what I would see the incarnation as is as the, the, the first fruits from the dead, a new kind of life, as you mentioned, where in, in the same way that the logos can come to greater expression in human beings than it can in uh, other animals, then the idea is that after the, the logos has constrained the possibility, like since the beginning of time for humans to appear, and even within Israel, like you can see all of the, the weird constraints that Israel has had to become like this pure vessel of possibility for God to act, you get like this, this constant this constant act of the logos at the grandest scale until the logos can then have a vessel of possibility to act like at the scale of just one person to bring in a new kind of life, which would then happen. So uh, I'm trying to bring in like both aspects of what the John you mentioned earlier and what Paul you just brought up, like this uh, this author writing himself into the story, like the, of the logos coming to greater expression until you get to Christ where you have a new kind of expression of the logos, which like the claim is that this will spread. Um, so yeah, thank you. So, I mean, uh, thank you for reading the Nishitani. Um, I, I think that's one of the top five uh, most profound books I've read in my life. Um, I've read it twice and I plan to read it again. And I think the Kyoto School is really, I mean, the Kyoto School should be more in all of these discussions because that is the school that is bridging between Eastern and Western philosophy, uh, but directly at, directly, you know, pointed at the meaning crisis. Religion and nothingness is about the meaning crisis, nihilism. Uh, Nishitani's book, The Self-Overcoming of Nihilism, is that, you know, so Nishitani has had a profound impact on me. Um, so first of all, um, so I, 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 I thank you for doing that. Paul, I'll try not to speak at a disadvantage to you because I don't know if you've read it, but uh, JP and I have, but I'll, we'll try and I've keep it as, it. yeah, uh, I recommend it. It, it. It's a masterpiece and it's generally regarded as, as such. I think deservedly so. Um, so I'll try, I'll, we'll try to, like, I'll try to be as explanatory as I can if I invoke it. I don't want to leave you out. I, oh, before I said uh, we're amphibians, I always carry around my frog. Uh, <laughs> so I carry him out my frog because the idea that we're amphibians is actually directly from the Neoplatonic uh, tradition. So the, the frog is my Neoplatonic tradition and my rock is my, my the, 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 the Zen. And then the Kyoto school, of course, is the bringing of the two together. So I'm always carrying them around uh, to remind me. Um, so a couple of things. First of all, one more um, note of appreciation, and I'd like to do a little bit of advertising about it. Uh, and this has to do with something, you know, that uh, Greg Enriquez and I are going to be releasing on his podcast. Uh, we're trying to make a case for naturalism as something. And so the, if I can have just two minutes on that. Yep. Uh, the idea is I make the claim that most, no, almost nobody's a materialist anymore uh, because people don't we think that everything's made out of matter. That's rather a, kind of a, that's, a, that's basically a 17th century ontology. Uh, there's all kinds of things. There's fields, there's forces, there's causation, there's temporal relations, there's the curvature of space, there's the continuum, there's potentially multiple universes, blah, 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 blah. So technically, I would say most people are physicalists, and then there's variations of physicalists. There are reductive physicalists who say everything can be replaced ultimately by the language of physicalism. And then there are non-reductive materialists who say, no, no, there are things that can't be reduced. They, are con they're ne they will never be inconsistent uh, with the physics, but they are non-reducible to it. Um, and this has to do with a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, Emer real emergence, uh, the fact that the level at which people are doing science has to really exist, 
or the science doesn't really exist. And then the science can't tell us that everything is reducible to the bottom layer, uh, right? You, you've heard me make these arguments so that I'm a non-reductive material, uh, non-reductive physicalist, not any kind of materialist or uh, reductive physicalist. This is a position, by the way, that's not, I'm not some weird freaky fringe person um, in the scientific community. I, I think I'm fairly mainstream. And, and so, um, and I, 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 I get it that you guys want to still, I'm trying to say thank you. So just hang on, that you still want to criticize the sufficiency claims of naturalism. But I want to thank you for making it clear that naturalism, non-reductive physicalism, right, is not materialism. And it shouldn't be criticized or straw man as some kind of materialism. That's that's unfair. That's unfair. And and so I wanted to. I mean, JP, you were you were you were meticulously careful about that. And I wanted to acknowledge and thank, thank you. you for that. I think. Yeah. And even your even your. I, there's a sense of of trying to say like I can get, I can come up with an account that might be consistent, although not reducible. That's also in the spirit of what we're talking about here. So I wanted to say, say thank you. Um, I brought up Nishitani because there were the, um, and I thought this might engender some deepening of the discussion and then I'll, I'll make that point and perhaps we can op open things up a little bit. So Nishitani of course is coming out of the a Zen Buddhist tradition and his definition of religion I think is really apropos here. He calls it the real self-realization of reality which is this fundamental, and I want to be really clear. You know how I use realization in the double sense? I got it from Nishitani. He's explicitly using realization in that double sense, the real self-realization of reality. And I, the reason I brought that up is that sounded very much like what, and JP's nodding, so at least I, my, my intuition was at least prima facie correct, very much what JP was, was talking about that, right? There, right, that w in human beings, we see the possibility of what you know, the logos uh, coming to this greater and greater self-realization. It's it's much more implicit in inanimate things, more explicated. And this is a Aristotle and Plotinus, right? Much more explicated in animals and so on and so forth. Now, the reason why I brought it up, and so here's the point of challenge. Uh, so I've tried to be really friendly about this because I, I really appreciate what you've done, and I want to respond in kind, right? Thank you. Is that Nishitani is offering that? And he defines it as religion, so he makes it very clear. And he, he, it's the kind of religious state, if I can put it that way, using his language, now that I've given his definition, that is the response to the, the threat of nihilism, hence the book, Religion and Nothingness. When we get to the real self-realization of reality, we can take the no-thingness that has a purely negative sense in nihilism, and it is inverted, it, it is aspect changed to be the most profound positive thing that we can experience. It becomes the field and, right? So, and you guys are familiar with this from your own Christian tradition. The no-thingness of God is different from the no-thingness of evil, right? And what Nishitani is claiming, it, right? I'm, I was invoking Augustine there, right? Uh, what, 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 what Nishitani is claiming is this state, it, right, of enlightenment is precisely the thing that brings about that shift in people's realization. And he argues that that is the fundamental response to nihilism. Is, is, that, is that fair? Yep. To your reading, JP, and, and Paul, does that sort of at least make a prima facie sense to you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then I want to invoke one other thing, because I evoke, evoked Augustine. I'm trying to use the American pronunciation. You guys say Augustine. I was always taught Augustine, so I don't know yeah. uh, what, what that's supposed to mean. <laughs> but I want, I want to point to something in the Confessions that is really interesting, and it always has, it, it's always intrigued me. And I take it that you, that, uh, uh, Augustine is, you know, especially for you, JP, but I think Paul, you've invoked him several times. And he's one of the he's one of the masters of this whole discussion, the logos and all of this. And in the confession, the thing that I want to point to is not his conversion, but the experience he had before his conversion. Yeah. Because he relates that he has a mystical exp experience, union with the one, but he can't maintain it. But it, it, it he thinks it in some sense prepares him and opens him up to the possibility. Of, of conversion. So the meta, the, if I can say it in trying to use the Greek language, the Neoplatonic metanoia prepares him for the Christian metanoia. But I, I was always intrigued by the fact that, right, Augustine admits that he was able to achieve it temporarily. And JP points to that 
at least to in maybe something similar with the mathematician. Is, is, yep. is that fair? Am I being- Yes, yes. Here? Okay. Yes. All right. So I'm, I really, like I said, I'm deeply appreciative of the way I've been treated and I want to respond deeply in kindness is important to me. So let's say we've got somebody within the Orthodox Christian tradition who, and his, his thing is, well, I achieved it, but I couldn't maintain it. And then he, uh, uh, he has the whole original sin theory, the gravitas that pulls him down, uh, right? But Nishitani belongs to a tradition that doesn't have that idea and has the idea of the Buddha and not just the Buddha, multiple people who achieve what I would call enlightenment. And this does become their permanent and ongoing way of being. That's what they report. Uh, and, and, and that's what the tradition holds. And so what I, again, all right, is that this seems to be a state that, and, and, and you guys know that I tried to give an account of enlightenment within Awakening from the Meaning Crisis and that a naturalistic account. So isn't it, isn't it, and, and of course, we also have within the Neoplatonic tradition, Porphyry reports that, you know, Plotinus achieved union with the one and he was able to do it multiple times, not quite continuous, but he was close to that, et cetera, right? Is it not possibly the case that other individuals have achieved a continuity of the real self-realization of reality? Um, and it's reported in these other traditions. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not like a card carrying Buddhist or anything like that. Uh, you guys know that. Uh, but so uh, what, I'm what I'm bringing up is, I, I think you're right about differences of degree producing differences of kind. And I think, I think it, the idea of enlightenment described as a new kind of life is beautifully accurate for how I see enlightenment. And don't forget, Plato's theory is a theory of enlightenment. You come out of the cave into the light, yep. right? Yep. The Platonic and like even the Zen, and don't forget the Kyoto school from Suzuki on saw deep resonance between the Zen account of enlightenment and the Platonic account. So I'm not doing something slippery here, right? That you get accounts of individuals who have achieved enlightenment. Yes. And I want to say, well, doesn't that hold out the possibility that this is a state that is, sorry for this part, you got, this is the part that will be wincy, that is naturalistically realizable by human beings. The, the Buddha famously argued that no divine intervention was needed for enlightenment. The gods were irrelevant. Um, that's what makes him, yes, there's gods in the Buddhist world, but what makes him a non-theist is exactly that claim, right? Um, and he explicitly said he wasn't a god. He refused to perform miracles. He's kind of the opposite in some ways, right? Um, so uh, that's what I'm holding out as the challenge, the challenge topic. And I hope it's taken in, in good spirit because I offered it um, in, in, in good faith. So, yes, yes. Do you want to respond first, Paul? Sure, or? sure. Okay. I, I, I guess I would, you know, I, in some ways, I asked the question, what are we looking for? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been ever since my, I stumbled into this weird world of Jordan Peterson and then this little corner of the internet. One of the things that I had never had to deal with on a, on a, on a on ongoing basis in my ministry was the reality of psychedelics and uh, people's um, ex, I'll, I'll say people's exploration of reality with, with psychedelic drugs. Um, and I had uh, quite a bit more experience of working with people with street drugs. Let, let, me, let me say, let me offer this idea that in the gospels, Jesus regularly goes to solitary places to pray. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he takes his disciples. His disciples don't seem particularly good at it because often the times he goes with them, they don't quite know what to do. They fall asleep. But that's, that's sort of normal with this kind of thing. Uh, there, is, there is the one time when Jesus is transfigured and Jesus tells them to, you know, well, let's just keep this between us, which, uh, you know, at least until after the events that Jesus anticipates. But the, the times that Jesus goes to the mountain, and we assume um, experiences union with the Father, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are for Jesus in continuation with miracles such as 
uh, turning water to wine, multiplying loaves and fishes, raising the dead. And so I guess what I would offer is that um, whereas I don't have, I don't feel a need to sort of demand exclusivity with respect to um, human experiences, because none of us can see from the inside what is going on in a with a um, with a Buddhist monk who is an expert at at what what they are doing in the temple or or any of any you know what, what we basically see on one level is a person you know you know there's stories of levitation and stuff we'll set that aside for now but basically what we see if we go to someone practicing one variety of pursuit of the divine via an inside experience is a person sitting tranquilly and still for a while and then they will come out and they will give a report of you know to the degree that they can of the ineffable let's say but one of the things that I think is central to Christianity with respect to the Gospels and so often misunderstood is that the miracles that Jesus does are intended to in some ways be taking what happens inside that personal connection with the divine and manifesting it in materiality. And so if you look at, say, Lewis's book on miracles, when you get to the end of the book, Lewis talks about miracles of the old creation and miracles of the new creation. And what I would say, Jesus, um, you know, if, if I would continue on the line that Lewis sort of gives us indication of, what I would say Jesus does is what he does on the mountaintop when he, you know, the, 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 the gospel simply report he went to the mountain to pray. Okay, doesn't he doesn't come down and say, oh, this, 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 this. The apostle Paul gives some renderings of, you know, some little clues about he's taken up to the third heaven, yada, yada, yada. But what happens in the miracles, in the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, in the water to wine, is that Jesus is saying, I am taking what has happened inside of me in my communion with the Father, and I am expressing it in the world with this miracle here and now. And, and sort of like the experience within, let's say, a, a meditative union with God, the, you know, the, the multiplied loaves and fishes do decay. The, the, the wine is consumed. The, the dead that Jesus raises die again. The point of that, of those miracles are in some ways analogous to the engineer and the bridge. And, you know, I, part of the reason I really liked JP's continuation is that the, the engineer and the bridge and the multiplication of loaves and fishes are also within a continuum of God reaching through us via logos and manifesting his work in the world. Can I respond to that, JP, or do you want to respond to what I said, or how should we, how would you? Um, I, I think I can respond right now. It's, uh, I think it goes in, in the same area as Paul. So probably once you respond to, probably you can respond to both of us, John, then. Um, yeah, that's to me. I, I think there's, there, there's like differences in how we conceive of the logos or dharma and how we also conceive of the experience of thank you for doing that by the way dharma and logos are very close translations of each other thank you i think in some translations of the bible in india that's the word they, they, yeah. they used for logos exactly and so i think there's like in the same way that we 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 will differ john i think in how we conceive of the logos and how we share responsibility we will also differ in how a human a human experiences union with the logos um, and in, in in the article, I don't know if you noticed, but I never talked about supernaturalism. I, I tried as much as possible within that article to see if I could even say something that would be compatible with non-reductive naturalism. Uh, I didn't like just come out and say that, okay, well, 
John is a secret supernaturalist, and like within his ontology, I can. Sort of... not. So that was that was uh, that was uh, that was uh, very, very <laughs> accurate and kind of you at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and but I I suspect that there's like a a deep. I think that the let's say the kinds of supernaturalism that I see Aquinas defending or church fathers defending is much closer to the kind of non-theism that I see Nishitani defending as well. Like I think basically a lot of the, it's the worry that lots of people have against supernaturalism is almost the same as the worry that Thomists will have against uh, like people denying divine simplicity. Like we, we don't want to say that the supernatural is some sort of parallel track to the universe. We, we want to say that it's the ultimate ground of everything that is simple, immutable, and so on. And mm -hmm. the way that the logos will incarnate in Christ, for instance, isn't because like some event happened in the in, in the ground of being, like that logos changed or whatever. We want to say, at least in the classical tradition, that it's the relationship between some entity and the world and the logos that appeared and the logos itself didn't change. So anyway, I, I do think that there will I'm not sure exactly what the differences will be between, let's say, Aquinas' God and Nishitani's emptiness, but I don't think it's as far as, let's say, most people could uh, could surmise. Even I've heard um, David Bentley Art mentioning that the like the kind of non-theism that we see in in Buddhism, for instance, he sees it as as a health, an healthy rejection of many kinds of theism or bad uh, yeah. theological attempts in in Christianity. So yeah. He's one of the few of the big popular names in, who talks about non-theism in a respectful and serious fashion, and um, and you know and his the, the the what the experience of God he yeah, actually yeah. uses the three characteristics drawn from Vedanta yeah. to try and like bliss and, and stuff like that to try and describe it. Um, so he he is somebody from the West who's I think uh, sincerely reaching out to the East. If I can, I don't like that language, but we don't have other language right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's right. So uh, that's exactly why I recommended Nishitani because I think there is, and, and you know, and, and like I said, you see from DT Suzuki on and Nishitani, you see people, you see the the people in the Kyoto school recognizing resonance with Neoplatonism, mm -hmm. and I, I agree with uh, John Caputo, you know, uh, also a, a sort of a, a I guess a post-Christian non-theistic theologian who's fairly significant right now because he's one of the theo theologians I think who's reg who's wrestled with postmodernism like very successfully and come out with something very powerful him and mark taylor i think are the two premier examples uh, so just to get advertise for their important work because caputo says that uh basically the attraction you know the kyoto school is attracted to heidegger because of the mystical element in heidegger's thought which is from eckhart and of course we know that eckhart is coming out of the neoplatonic tradition within christianity so they keep recognizing each other yeah. and calling to each other across very significant divides. And I want to point out that, that yeah. that's something really important we should pay attention to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe we can, we can that can be fertile ground. Uh, 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 can, can I, there yeah. was a second step to my response that oh, ties I'm in. Sorry. I'm, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, it's good, it's good. I just don't want to lose track because I was trying to tie it in with what Paul said as well. Oh, um, please. Because please. in the same way that we, so we will have some disagreements about the logos uh, itself. I'm not sure exactly how those will play out in practice. But I think those map down also to how we see the logos incarnate. Uh, and there was a, a place uh, in, um, in Nishitani's book, Religion and Nothing. I even remember it's on page 201. He mentions that, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I read it like over the last week, so it's, it's fresh. Uh, he, he mentions that, okay, so the role of people who achieve enlightenment is to like induce enlightenment in others as well. Yeah. And, but the fact is we live in a history where most people are not in a state of enlightenment. Uh, and you mentioned that there hasn't been much thought uh, within Buddhism about like how, how the history, like how you can see the unfoldment of logos in history and how enlightenment is supposed to yep. spread in history. That's right, that's right. And he even mentions that uh, it, it, he would have expected it to come up uh, in uh, Mayana Bud Buddhism, where there's like this great idea that comes close to Christianity, where people take a vow when they like the bodhisattvas. They, they, yes, yeah, the bodhisattvas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bodhisattvas. They, they 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 take up a vow that they will not 
uh, enter into nirvana until they have brought all beings uh, into the nirvana themselves. So like they just keep reincarnating and, until they can bring everyone to, to, uh, to nirvana, to enlightenment. And that's that at this point, you start getting close to the idea that within Christianity, the way that we conceive of the logos, even though the logos remains immutable, doesn't change, even though emptiness remains the same, we want to say that there's there's like some, the ways that Dharma is constituted or the ways that lo the Logos is constituted will reach towards greater and greater incarnation of the Logos or of the Dharma. It's kind of a, really an incarnation is sort of coming down into potentiality to bring something down. So what like the, the movement that I see within Mahayana Buddhism towards like this drive to sort of come back down to spread enlightenment is like reaching towards what I see in Christianity where the, the Logos also comes down to spread the new kind of life that we see in Christ. Uh, but so, so I, I see those kinds of two things where you know, in the same way that Paul was talking about the experience of Jesus on the mountain coming down to bring something down, to bring part mm -hmm. patterns into like incarnation. Uh, I would, I would argue, but it's all, I don't have like clear cut arguments. It's, it's part of why I like to have this conversation. Like I, <laughs> I see that there's like something different about the way that the logos incarnates within Christianity that I don't see like exactly in how the logos incarnates in Buddhism. Sure, but that's a symmetrical argument, of course. Yes, yes, that's true. That's true. Right. So it's like yeah. difference is a symmetrical property. Um, so uh, the, I'm glad you see though that there's at least sort of approximations or, or relevant similarities uh, because one of the things that you get in the Nishitani book, and I think, and I think this th this needs to be said about Erigena too. Is like, and I've I've kept trying to emphasize this it, it, to replace the hierarchical model, right, with the complete interpenetration of emergence and emanation. There's no emanation without emergence. There's no emergence without emanation. They're completely interpenetrating, and, and that, and, and to use your language, if if it's not trespassing the complete and utter identity between God's transcendence and his imminence. Mm -hmm. That um, uh, if you keep them as radically opposite and not fundamentally ontologically identical, you're actually dividing God in a way that trespasses on the unity of God, I think. I, that was the er Erigena's argument, at least, as far as I could see it. Um, and so it seems to me that if that's the case, what we're talking about isn't I want to be really careful here. Is it like an ontological case of, uh, of something incarnating, but more, as you said, at a level, there's levels of realization and a particular level is available. And this is why I like the new life. There's a particular level yep. and any being at that level will have that kind of life, have that kind of realization. And, it, and so that's kind of what I'm arguing for. Now, I want to respond to, to Paul and that I, I think that's like the, the point about the, so one of the things that's always intrigued me, and I'm glad we're in a good faith discussion because I can talk to you guys about this without, right, um, right, is, is the, the opposite attitudes towards miracles in the two traditions. Uh, there, there's indications that the Buddha was capable of some miracles, but he steadfastly refused to perform miracles. In fact, he said, this is how you will know somebody's not one of my disciples if they offered to perform a miracle. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and, and I don't know if, you got, if, you, if I've ever related the, 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 how, how the, the Buddha with the, the woman who lost her child? No. Nope. Okay, because I, I want to tell this story because it's a way in which the enlightenment comes into materiality yep. in a, a really palpable way. So if you give me a moment, uh, yep. you know, and, and you guys got tons of parables, so, <laughs> yep. right? So a woman comes to the Buddha and she says, you know, her son has died and she wants him to raise him from the dead. Now, nobody thinks this is an, a, a ridiculous request, by the way, okay? So she says, will you raise him from the dead? Will you raise him from, and he, no, 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 go away, go away, go away. And she keeps coming and then he, he right? Uh, very much like Jesus with the woman at the well, right? He, he, okay, let's, he says, I'll raise your son from the dead, but you have to do one thing for me. Um, and she says, what? She said, and by the way, it's a mustard seed again, which is really kind of weird. He says, you have to go into town and you have to get a mustard seed from somebody's house. And she says, oh, oh, sure, great. And he's, oh, no, one condition. 
You have to get a mustard seed from a house that has not tasted the grief of death. And she, oh, of course. And she goes in and she knocks on the door and she, do you have mustard seed? Yes. Has, in, are, has anybody suffered grief from, oh yes. And she goes from house to house, to house, to house. And now think about the mathematician having the insight. Yep. And then she goes, oh, right. And she goes back to the Buddha and she says, thank you. And that was the response to grief, right? Um, and she gets a kind of insight. Now, to me, Paul, that sounds like a very powerful, um, you know, materialization, if, if, we'll, if we'll use that word, right, of enlightenment into, the, you know, the healing of a woman who is experiencing one of the most profound, you know, uh, you know, negative experiences that human being, and he's transforming it into what grief can do for human beings, which is make them human in a way. Like one of the wisest persons in my life said to me, don't get deeply involved with somebody who hasn't tasted grief because they haven't reached the depths of their humanity. And that was like, oh, right. And that's what he's doing. So like I see, I'm offering, I, I'm saying that's not the same thing as a miracle, but it's like, it seems to be to be a materialization that is uh, of considerable value. So that was offering as a response. I, when I think about, you know, there, there's obviously the wisdom, the wisdom of that story is profound. Yes. Yeah. And, um, but, but when I, when I ask myself, I, I know, you know, I know very little, um, I should read Nishitani's book because I, I really, I'm not conversant at all in, um, I'm sorry in for Eastern, you at a I mean, I've been, I've spent my whole life you know, where I am and doing what I am. Um, but the, so, so going back to Lewis, Lewis and his book, I mean, part of what, part of what Lewis offers in that book for me, and part of why the book was so helpful was it does, um, it does connect what, what in, at least my formation within the Christianity available to me when and where I grew up was sort of a disconnected world. And the, the, the stories of Jesus are these, um, are, are these very sometimes strange, it, it's certainly not a fairy tale. Well, I shouldn't yeah. say that, but, but it's, it's certainly not mere wish fulfillment. No, no, I get what you meant. Yeah, yeah, um, and but yet it is, it is the, it is the. I, I guess maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm not doing anything more than reiter, reiter, reiterate, reiterating my point that, in some ways, the experience, the experience of union, that we can that we can have to whatever degree we do. And I think those degrees scale too. I mean, not too far from my, uh, from where I live is Yosemite National Park. And if you go down there during the summer, you find the valley floor is just swamped with tourists from all over the world to look at rock. I mean, that's, that's what they look at. They look at rock. But when you go to Yosemite Valley and you walk in that valley and you see El Capitan and you see Half Dome and you know many other features, you you say, I mean, people go there because you know there's there's a lift, there's a you know something happens at a very small level, but enough to have people travel from all over the world, Asia, Europe, all to come to Yosemite Valley. I think part of what Christianity offers is the is the realization that the the good materiality of this world can somehow be joined with its author in a way that is not simply psychological and that that in fact so lewis's central central chapter in 
in the book Miracles is the grand miracle where, of course, the incarnation comes and he dives all the way to the depths and he pulls the rest up with him and into, into a, and of course, in Christianity, the result of all of this is a new creation. And of course, within the Christian tradition, there's a lot of trying to get at, okay, what, what on earth are we talking about with this? So of course, we've, with Dante, you've got the, the beatific vision. And so that has been an attempt. But in, you know, in the ends, at the end of the book of Revelation, for example, there is this, there's this new creation. And this, of course, is also seen in the book of Isaiah, where maybe for now, the um, the devoted, disciplined, practiced holy man can can discover wisdom and beauty and and in a sense the the an escape from death and a and a taste of eternity, which is you know as Augustine difficult to maintain, difficult sure. to maintain for very long. I, I think inherent in Christianity and manifest by the miracles is the idea that materiality itself will participate in what right now only we, the strange amphibians, can touch on for mm. only certain sacred moments. Mm. And I, I think that is, in fact, the gospel. And now there's lots of questions all the way on down about that. And, and this is why I think in the Christian tradition, you know, right now, for example, in the midst of a pandemic, when in church, we thank God for, of course, this will be controversial with everything's controversial. You know, I just had my, I just had my second Pfizer shot in my arm this morning, but okay. Which I'm glad. Yeah. So the, so the, you know, the, the, the scientists, you know, that, that entire civiliz civilization machinery that has led to an mRNA vaccine in my arm to combat this virus, this is all the, spirit, the work of the Spirit of God. And this is, this is a part of the, this grand movement that God has undertaken, exemplified in the Incarnation, which is moving us towards um, final union, which which now maybe we only experience at the at the limits of our capacity, but by virtue of a vaccine, by sanitation, by irrigation, by you know all of the stuff that is happening in technology, that is happening in culture, that is happening in art. All of this is moving us towards final, um, some final reunion with, and and with what we were made for. And so, and and I think the the critique of miracles that I hear in your story, I don't find alien at all in Christianity because Jesus was very critical of the crowds who were looking for him for. Yeah. Easy solutions, easy yep. answers, a display yep. and a show. And he would often say, you know, you ask the, you know, a perverse generation asks for a sign. I'll give you the sign of Jonah. And then he says, Jonah spent three days in the belly of the fish. And everybody probably listened to him and thought, <laughs> are we going to take a trip to the sea? Um, and of course, he was speaking about resurrection. But I think the entire flow of this in Christianity is, is not you know, is not, I, I, I think it's intelligible and understandable. And I think part of the reason, well, there's a lot of ways that we went wrong, but I'll leave it right there. I hope that is intelligible because I, I actually don't think many people understand that this is what Christianity is really about. But I think it is. That's, that's how I understand what I understand Christianity to be about. Paul, can I just ask a, a, an understanding question? It's not a challenge. Sure. So what I'm hearing you say, and I, again, not a challenge, but just I want to make sure I'm understanding you, that what Christianity is saying is something like 
all of nature could be brought to this higher level of realization. Yes. Am I understanding you correctly? Yes. And that's the central point of the miraculous element in Christianity is to point to that redemption of the world, if, 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 to use more sort of religious language. Have I, uh, have I understood? Yes. You? yes. Okay. And that's Lewis's contention in the book too. Right. Okay. Uh, I'll let JP uh, respond. I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we see that in the original too, right? Uh, of how all of nature is meant to, like all of, yeah, nature. The original uses nature in a term that's like different from what we're using right now. But let's say all of material reality is supposed to also come back to the creator through humans ultimately. Uh, and but yeah, as far as the the response, it seems, I I suspect we we reach a point where it gets difficult to get deeper at the issue metaphysically, and Paul in large part was speaking existentially. And I think this is kind of what we have to do, um, like as far as choosing, how does, what does the incarnation of the, like what, what do we choose? How do we choose to conceive of the logos and its incarnation? Um, in, in the article, I was in large part trying to show that it's at least intelligible to speak of the incarnation, even if like we can, even though a, a naturalist would likely want to disagree at some parts, it's like, I wanted to make the claim that it's intelligible. And I really like the way that you two just put it in terms of how it's, it's not just humans that get to participate uh, in the logos, but like all of creation is meant to participate in the logos through humans. Um, and earlier, Paul, you also talked about your experience like living with people and being able to offer them this experience. And I don't know a lot about Buddhism. I mean, I, I read uh, Nishitani's book and I just watched a few like lectures and videos online to get an idea. But the way also that, the, to bring it back almost to the, the point I said earlier about history, the way that enlightenment is spread is different. Um, I've heard, and you, uh, please correct me, John, if I'm wrong, but I've heard that in practice in many places where Buddhism is more spread, uh, like the practices that the monks will do are very different from the practices that the lay people will do. Uh, in I mean, with let's say but, but that's the same in Christianity too. To be yeah, fair. yeah, yeah, that's true. But I mean, right. like the I think that's, that's more of a sociological fact than something that goes to the heart of the religions. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's true. You you, you can see the the, same, the parallel phenomenon where there is kind of an idea that the monks will reach enlightenment through meditation and practice and so on, and the lay people are doing other kinds of practices that will prepare them in a future life where they will be monks and then they will achieve enlightenment. Uh, does that sound fair or I, like, am I um, getting a wrong simple? Yeah, a little bit. The Mahayana, you know, is uh, it, there's, there's many, you know, and, and there's many strands of Buddhism, like there are many strands of Christianity. Yeah. Um, um, so um, I, I guess what I would say is, um, well, let, let me do another story from the Buddha because yep. I, I want to try and, and then I, I let me let me try and be clear about uh, this what's being claimed, and then I, I want to try and respond to um, Paul's point because I think Paul made an excellent point, and I think JP I think the the, the point you made and the, I think you're trying to get back to is uh, there's a commitment just like Paul said there's a commitment to the materiality mm -hmm. of the world I think your point is in Christianity there's a commitment to history um, that's important it, yes it, I think so yeah. Yeah. The, okay. The, the logos okay. will manifest through yeah. history. Yeah. yeah. And I'm trying to, and the, and that what you're saying is in in Christianity, these are brought together in a powerful way. Um, so first of all, I want to emphasize the the that uh, we talked about the amphibious, right? The Neoplatonic tradition. I carry the frog around, and that's because the frog has a diff is a different kind of organism, a different kind of life. And so the Neoplatonists thought they could achieve a, a, a new kind of life, not just a momentary thing. Um, and the same thing with the Buddha, and and this is the story of how he got his title. So he achieve, he sits under the Bodhi tree, he achieves enlightenment. He's walking down the street, and he's met by people. And I, I think this I put this in the series, but I'll just remind you of it. And and they're just sort of like impressed by his countenance; it's shining, right? Um, phenomenon, right? And uh, and they say to him, "Are you a god?" And he says, "No." And they say, "Well, are you a heavenly messenger?" "No." "Are you a prophet?" "No." And then they're frustrated and they say, are you just a man? And, the, and he goes, no, which in that last answer is important. And they say, well, what are you then? And he says, I am awake. See, it, so he's not 
he's not trying to talk about a, a momentary, he's talking about, right, an ontological change. Um, so I wanted to say, Buddhism isn't making a psychological claim, it's making an ontological claim. Uh, and again, um, and I think the Neoplatonists are too. That's why the frog, right? The symbolism is clear. And so uh, now I want to put that out because I, th I think I, I want to I sort of push back on what it's just a psychological thing. I don't think that's yep. fair. I think it's existential ontological. Now, I do want to come back to the points that I do think, I think are, are really good points that you guys are making, which is uh, the redemption of history and the redemption of the material world and that something is being pointed to with the, in, if I can put it this way, there's something being pointed to in the incarnation above enlightenment um, that is a way of talking about the redemption of history. And of course, JP, you connect that to the history of Israel and Paul, the redemption of the materiality of the world. And so if, if I, if I, if I, because I think those are good points. I just, uh, sorry, I didn't yes, mean your yes. previous point, Paul, about psychology wasn't a good point, but I think it can be responded to. Um, uh, but th these two points I think are excellent because, you know, I've always, and I hope this isn't insulting, because from my point of view, it's honoring. I've always conceived of Jesus as an enlightened being, right? Um, um, I've conceived of other people as enlightened, Socrates, and, uh, you know, and the Buddha, and, right, these figures that seem to be able to cause titanic sh yep. seismic shifts in history and culture, and, uh, and those three figures clearly have that. Uh, have that. And that to me is evidence of something being at work in them um, different than the momentary experiences of uh, Augustine or, or you and I, yep. right? And, and, and Paul, you've made arguments similar about this. You know, it's the world changing aspect of Christianity that points to something deeper. And I think by fairness, we can say, well, there's world changing aspects in the Buddha, there's world changing aspects in Socrates. So we should take that as evidence for something deeper than a momentary state. I think that's a fair argument on my yep. part. To make. Yes, yes. Right, right. So what I hear is, and, and you guys are acknowledging that, and thank you, I appreciate that. That's good. And so what you're saying is, well, you're not saying this, but I'm saying it and trying to play in your ballpark, you know. Jesus is enlightened like these other figures, but there's something more about history and materiality that we don't see in the other enlightenment figures. I think that's a very good point. I think those are very good points. And, and maybe part of what is meant by incarnation above and beyond enlightenment is exactly those two points. Jesus isn't just enlightened, let's say he is, right? But there's also that enlightenment is also redeeming the points to the possible redemption of the material world and history, right? Um, I hadn't thought of that. I'm I'm sort of I'm I'm just I'm just like grokking it uh, for those of you who know Heinlein, uh, <laughs> right? Um, I think that's a very good point. Now I guess the and JP already acknowledges this, so maybe we're getting to this point. I don't think those two points can be established argumentatively. I mean, they're promises, right? They're promises. And yeah. so um, what you, you, now what you can say, perhaps, I, 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 don't, I, I hesitate to put words in your mouth, but you can say something like, maybe we can get to this, you know, enlightenment and we can get, and that gets, that closes the gap between naturalism and what you guys are talking about considerably. But then there's still the gap is open because the incarnation carries within it two promises that are not promised by these other examples of enlightenment. And that can't be reached by naturalistic argument, but nevertheless, it, it, it's, we've closed the gap considerably. It's, it, does that feel fair to, to you two? Oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Oh yes. And, and I think the gap, you know, fu gaps are funny things. You look at a spark plug, for example, a yeah. gap is really important because the gap sort of yeah. allows a connection that at closing would not allow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and you know I want to on on part of on part of JP's point, you know I'm I'm often I'm often critiquing or even sometimes criticizing the Protestant tradition, even though I am a Protestant, so I'm allowed to do so. And it's um, honorable of you to do so, by the way. But one of the things that, and, and I won't say that the Roman Catholic tradition didn't do this, but I know that the 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 reformers emphasized it. Um, the so. 
part of what Luther pointed to and and very much the Swiss Reformation, which was Wingley and Calvin and others, was that the um, not everyone, not everyone will get to be a someone who will go into a cloister or a monastery and have powerful world transforming visions, mm -hmm. but that the the mason and the farmer and the mother and the the daughter and the son and even the cow and the squirrel um, do in their way do the work of participation in this reunion with the divine and um and that is you know that that was a profound point made by luther and again like with all of these things there's back and forth in it but the and so for example when in the you know what the swiss reformers have been doing some reading from the reformation period lately part of what the swiss swiss reformers wanted to do was the the city the city and of course they're following augustine here they, they want to manifest the city of God mm -hmm. in our midst. And, and that also was a participation in this, in this movement. And again, I mean, the, these arguments in terms of comparing East and West, West are always fraught because they're, they're probably far more complex than any of us have the data um, to, to really intelligibly, intellig intelligibly make. But, the, the fact that that science arose as it did in the West, I think also speaks to this, because there was a theological disposition towards manifesting, you know, we can, we, the Christianity talks about it a lot of different ways, the kingdom of God or the will of God, manifesting this in stone and wood. And of course, you see some of that with the East, with you know Feng Shui and Zen, and, you know all of those things. But manifesting it, and that this was not um, technology was not anathema to this process. In fact, technology was a part of this process, and that the the development of technology was itself part of the religious quest, as much as the the devoted monk. Mm -hmm. to their mm -hmm. prayers or meditation in the monastery. Mm -hmm. And and I think that is, you know, it, what's so interesting to me. So this week, part of what's been delightful about my, my few years on YouTube now is on one hand, I'm always got the meanderings of my mind and the conversation. I also have the discipline of the preaching schedule. And so this week I am preaching out of the gospel of Luke, where Jesus comes into a locked room and he shows them the scars but you know after these these post resurrection appearances they always have difficulty recognizing him you know you know he says it is i myself it is i myself and so as i'm meditating on the sermon that i'll preach this sunday i'm thinking about okay what you know the book of colossians the Jesus that they knew was sort of creation 1.0. Now the resurrected Jesus is sort of creation 2.0. And there's continuity in the scars, which is such an interesting thing to find continuity in, especially because, you know, the violence within the story is, you know, it, it's an attempt to kill God. I mean, it's all the way back to Genesis 3 in a sense, in a magnified sense. Yet at the same time, it's in that that he says, it is I myself. And, and then, of course, in the Christian story, Jesus, you know, spends a few weeks popping in on people, and then he ascends. So they all get the story. Okay, he's going to the control room of Earth, which is, you know, and Lewis goes into that in his book, Miracles. But then the point of that is that something of him himself with the scars gets into all of his followers via the Holy Spirit. And they are the ones, now again, back to the Reformation, they are the ones learning to farm better, learning to mother better and care for the home and develop technology. And so, and, and even those who would never enter a monastery still participate in this. 
as in the development of a vaccine. And so again, to me, that's, that's Christianity. I'd like to just add one thing on that front, Paul. Um, this is the, the, the fact that, okay, if you have within Christianity, the fact that the Logos manifested itself through this incarnation that con culminated in the self-sacrifice of the incarnate Logos, it gives something very concrete to unfold the Logos in history for everyone. Like it's readily accessible. I know tons of people, for instance, who get a spiritual experience at some time during liturgy by contemplating this self-sacrifice of the Logos. Uh, and then this makes them, even though like they don't need like any sophisticated theology or knowledge. I know plenty of like simple people who won't never spend time in a monastery who still get the the spiritual experience and which they will then unfold in their lives by doing their own self-sacrifice on behalf of people around them. So like this redeeming of, of history that happens within the incarnation, this redeeming of, of matter can apply to even very simple people who won't let's engage in the same discipline of spiritual exercises that monks will, for instance. So I want to try and pick up on this with some very powerful things. First of all, I had an insight. Sorry, that sounds pretentious, but I had a realization why the topic of teleology keeps coming up. And you know that I'm getting into discussions with people about it. Um, perhaps uh, this is a suggestion. Is, is this discussion of teleology an attempt to see the unfolding of the redemption of materiality and history at work? I mean, mm. is there a connection there, right? Is, the t mm. is, is, is this what people are doing? Are, like, I'm asking an open question here. Are they saying, okay, what's, like, I'm not, I'm not saying they're doing necessarily this explicit self-dialogue, but I'm speaking on their behalf, right? So what's unique, you know, it's the redemption of history, the redemption of materiality, and therefore I should see signs of that. Uh, you know, te teleology should be present in matter. I'm thinking of the discussion I had with Sam, and it should be present, right, um, at, at um, it should be present in history. There should be a telos in matter and a telos in history. Is, 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 do you think that's a fair connection I just made? Do you think that that's why? Yeah. Uh, so the discussion of teleology is perhaps the place where this uh, comes out argumentatively, if I could mm -hmm. put it that way. Um, now, um, about the self-sacrifice, I, I, again, uh, uh, I mean, in terms of historicity, uh, you know, other people have made this, this is not unique to me, you know, there's a lot of motifs in Christ's death, his trial and death, that are borrowed from Socrates, right? There, that was prepared. It, like, so it, it, it's, it, it's, it's definitely, right? That, it, it's definitely that, that motif, like, you know, the person who, yep. Yep. Right, right, who, 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 who dies willingly uh, in order to, you know, manifest uh, truths that cannot be manifest by living. I mean, that, that's that many people, you know, Socrates basically demonstrates the unexamined life is not worth living. And the only way he can actually demonstrate that in a way that would be transformative of other people is if he dies, right? If people are forcing him into the choice, the unexamined life or death, he chooses death and he does it voluntarily because he could have fled and he does it in order to really make clear, right? Um, the truth of that claim that the unexamined life is not worth living. Um, and I think that, again, I think that's reachable to, I mean, it, it still reaches across the centuries. It had a profound impact on me. Um, are, are you guys both here? Yeah. 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 I hope so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. now you froze. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You're back. Back, back yeah. normal. Uh, what did you hear? Uh, how, how far did it get? Reaches, reaches across the cent centuries. Are you guys okay, still here? Because that's I when I stopped talking. That's when I stopped talking was perfect. Me, yeah. Oh, pre a, a pregnant pause uh, there. <laughs> well, and, and, and you're, you know, so I was listening to, a, I was doing a little work in Rene Girard this morning too. And I, I would say that that motif and, and the gospels, I mean, the, 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 the Jesus story is amazing because on one hand, it is self-sacrifice. And on the other hand, he's a victim. I mean, those, both of those things come together and, and, you know, potentially there could be, you know, some of that in, in Socrates as well. But, you know, this sort of gets into sort of, you know, Jordan Peterson land, because you have these questions about, you know, in terms of the, 
you know, if there's physics, if there's physics in the world with respect to gravity and you know all of this stuff, is there also sort of relational physics out there that this this willing sacrifice mm -hmm. and the power it unleashes in terms of you know how we are relationally, you know, profoundly has echoes through the world, um, and 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 so you know. Again, while I've in my sermons, I've been a lot of people will say things to me like not a lot of people, but I hear it at least anyway. They'll, they'll say, "Okay, okay, Pastor, I'll grant you because everybody wants to look at the the first." Lewis makes this point in Miracles as well. The first five minutes after the resurrection, well, I don't know if a dead person can come back to life. Blah 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 blah. But every now and then, someone will say, "Okay, I'll grant you the walking out of the tomb, talking to his his buds, shooting up to heaven." So what? So what? And and I think you know with so if we would have we, if we would ask the question, okay, if Socrates after three days would come out of his tomb, what would he do? <laughs> That's wonderful, Paul. <laughs> That's very good. My laugh is not a ridicule. No, I know. I understand. Good. Because yeah. <laughs> I've been playing this with this idea, because Jesus does things that I would expect him to go up to Herod and Pilate and say, hey, ha, 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 ha. he doesn't do any of that. I don't think Socrates would either, but but the the question of how is the future transformed? And, and for John, for your project, this is a very big question. How, because when I look at your religion that isn't a religion, you and I mean this in all good faith, you want to see your efforts now transform the world and not just if the numbers of people, um, you know, the numbers of people experiencing, you know, you know, mystical experiences, you want to see the meaning crisis addressed. And that is relationally, and it's of course there's physicality involved in it because someone who is someone who has an awakened yes. from the meaning yes. crisis, and this you know will be a better father, and be a better partner, and be a better citizen. And in fact, right. you want your efforts to materially go out into the world, and in Jewish language, bring shalom, so that. And, and of course, Socrates' yep. death yep. is the same, you know, does the same thing. Yeah, yes. just one, one cool thing I'd like to add about Socrates is uh, in several Eastern churches, you'll see some Greek philosophers painted, let's say, as icons on the outside, because we'll recognize that they, like, they were deeply influential on the tradition. And on the other side of the spectrum, in in Catholic theology, especially in the last few decades with the interactions with other religions, it has become fairly mainstream, let's say, to say that let's say that enlightenment happens through the logos uh, and let's say it happens one way within Christianity for people who have let's say, a historical link to the incarnate logos, but it can also happen in other kinds of cultures, can be like approximated in all kinds of good ways by other people who get into communion with the logos, we it's more of a hierarchical claim, I think. The same kind of a gap that we were talking about earlier. It's not only on Eastern churches, right? It's not only, because I've, I've been to the Vatican. I've seen the School of Athens at the heart of the oh, Vatican, yeah. right? So it's also in the Catholic tradition too. I mean, uh, I, I think, I, I think um, yeah. Um, that, I mean, my point about Socrates, though, did not take away from the, the like, the, 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 like the, the point that I wanted to acknowledge on behalf of both of you, the, the redemption of the materiality, the promise of the redemption of materiality, the promise of the redemption of history. And you, you guys seem to agree with me that, that where that people are trying to take that up argumentatively is telos. But that's of course, again, where I, I, I'm not convinced by the teleological arguments. Well, um, well, what, well let's dig into telos a little bit more because I'm very interested in the ways, because I look at your project, John, and I think, you know, I want to see, just like Mary had said on her channel, I <laughs> want to see John helping, you know, people bound by the meaning crisis be free. And I've talked to 
Um, you know, I've talked to Mark and Manuel and yeah, many people yeah. over that have worked in that discord server. And, you know, when Manuel talks about, you know, he, you know, started meditating and that helped him get rhythms in his life. You know, I do nothing but cheer that because, you know, amen, Mark, you, you know, get your life in order. That's what I want for you. I want, and we all want. So, um, oh shoot, where was Sorry, I going with this? You were frozen there for a sec. What did you say, Paul? Uh, I got to the point where you talked about um, Mark and Manuel and then I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, but you know, when I, when I talk to them and I see that, you know, they're, you know, they have, you know, they have been blessed by you. I'll use Christian language. They've been blessed by you and your work. I cheer that. Yeah. And, um, but, but the, so the question of telos is very interesting because of course in Christianity, it was so interesting in, in one of the Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris things, Sam Harris actually used this illustration, which I blew my mind that he used it because in Christianity to a degree, theologically, the future pulls us towards it. You know, mm -hmm. not just, I mm -hmm. think often we imagine as progressivists that we are pushed by history, which in, for, in fact we are, but tell us a sort of the future pulls it towards us. But, you know, Christians have been asking questions about this too. You know, there's open theology where, well, how set is the future? And it's, you know, it's funny because a lot of Christians that are really high on TELUS will say, I know. But then if you start asking them detailed questions, they'll say, well, we can't know. So it's like, well, how much do you really know? <laughs> there's a there's a great place in, in the Summa where- Socratic humility. Um, I think we were speaking double. Uh, okay, I think I'll, I'll keep going. Um, yeah, there's a, a point in the Summa where Aquinas talks about God- shaping the world through both necessary causes and uh, contingent causes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think like the, in the same way that I think there's a lot of confusion about the supernatural when we turn it into so, some sort of parallel universe, there's also a tendency to take the teleology going on within creation as the teleology that let's say we humans act on the world. Uh, I think I think the way I, 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 I mean, I'll have to look more into this, but the way I tend to see it is more that the logos shapes, constrains the emergence within creation and it will emerge and, and, closer. Oh, go ahead. And, and there's, there's movement on within the philosophy of biology. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dennis Walsh here at U of T where he's reconfigured the notion of telos because when you talk about function if you talk about biology you're talking about function when you talk about function you're, you're invoking some kind of teleology because things are done for on purpose right um and it, he has been working i hope you can hear me because you guys yeah yeah we hear interview. everything yeah okay good uh okay great uh so he has a uh yeah he's been re He's been restructuring, uh, reconfiguring, reformulating, that's the word I'm looking for, the notion of teleology more and more uh, around this idea of constraints, um, constraints that are conducive to an organism's survival as opposed to causes that make it survive, right? And this language, I think, is, 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 is very important and very effective. And it's a very different picture from the, for, the forward pulling magnet uh, that is the typical way final causation and teleology is understood. So I, I agree with you, um, um, JP, that I think um, I think there is movement even within the scientific community, at least within the philosophy of biology, uh, to try and re -under, re understand teleology um, as this con constraints that conduce uh, in contrast to causes that produce, uh, yeah. which I think is a sort of a slogan way of putting it. I, and then for me, that moves it out of the future magnet, and it's more about again uh, the complete interpenetration of emergence and emanation. Yeah. Um, and so it it would lead to something like the complete interpenetration of teleology and causation, or our efficient and final. But we should maybe yeah. get rid of that language because I think that language has contributed uh, yeah. to 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 the, the mis the misapprehension. Yeah. Um, 
So hey, that's is, a good move. That's a good move you made, Paul. I mean, you know, maybe again, we can close the gap a little bit more by by uh, getting a, a, a naturalistic account of teleology that is not so um, antithetical to uh, the soteriological account. Um, you, that, that's a good point. I acknowledge that. I think that's a very good point. I, I think, you know, in and this has been true over a very long time for me. I, I part of me asks from for and and John, you are about. I have as much trust in you as a conversation partner as I do with just about anybody, even though we've never met physically yet. <laughs> just just in terms of my interactions with you, part of me always asks the question: What are we really afraid of with respect to some of these? Um, some of these theistic frameworks. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that there are plenty, I mean, human beings have used this stuff to do plenty of bad. But if we dismiss, if we dismiss things because human beings have used things for evil, <laughs> we've got nothing left. <laughs> everything, everything goes out the window. I, but I, the, but I, 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 think, I think part of what we fear is that, and I speak to this as a Calvinist because my tradition has been, oh, as scary on this as any. I, I, I think what we fear is, is the loss of our own freedom. And I think, John, probably one of the biggest you know, contributions that you have made for me in terms of my view of the world and my thought life is... Um, Freedom, as is colloquially used, doesn't work very well. But your your images of reciprocal narrowing and reciprocal broadening and agency, I found tremendously helpful to to sort of get a, get away from some of the limitations of freedom language, and and I think we fear mm -hmm. that a a a a personal yet arenic, powerful God that pulls us towards him, which is also pulling us towards our potentiality. In, in my view, Christianity and the miracles of Christ himself lead me to say that this process leads towards reciprocal broadening and actually the enlargement of my agency that in fact his agency and my agency are not in competition. Yeah. No, no. Uh, and, and I think this is what I hear from you with you, with your longing of, of, you know, my intimations of where you want to go. And I think this is true and right that what, and Lewis says this in many different ways, you know, God as our father wants us to be sons who grow up into manhood. And, um, and so you know, I, I hear a lot of fear from people of that. They fear that the bigger this God gets, the, 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 that, that we will then somehow be my, our relationship with that God will, will reduce us to reciprocal narrowing and yeah. less and less agency. Yeah. But I, I, I've always seen it the other way around. I agree with you. I think that is the case in um, a lot of anti-theism, um, um, and um, and I and I want to acknowledge that might it's reasonable to believe that's a bias in me because of my negative experience of a version of Christianity. So I don't want to dismiss what you're saying. Um, I I would say though that there's other I think there's other things. Um, uh, and, and you know, and the classical problems are there, and they're they're classical precisely because they're there. Which is, you know, the problem of evil. It's hard for me to see Auschwitz as part of the redemption of history. Mm -hmm. It's like if that's the only way you can redeem history, wow! Like, and I'm not saying that I have the right to judge God or anything, but if we're going to offer history as evidence, we have to consider history as evidence. We can't play yeah. according to a double standard, right? Yeah. Yes. And so, um, yeah, it think it, it, it's Auschwitz. Um, it, it's it, the fact that I see 99.99% of the universe just smashing into entropy and not showing any of this movement. Those are the things that I think are also at work. 
Um, I, I, I acknowledge the first point and I acknowledge that it's probably vectored into me because of my personal upbringing. I'm not dismissing it, but I'm saying I think there's other issues that are also part of uh, why, why there's, the, the, there's a challenge. I do think it's, 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 you know, I think there's also a fourth thing, which is, you know, just the cogency of arguments and theories, which I think we should also not dismiss. I think, you know, science has progressed the way it has, not just because of happenstance, it's progressed because it's unveiling something about the nature of reality that we have to take into consideration. Um, I don't want to have the last word, but I've got to go soon, uh, gentlemen. Um, but I would like to propose we have another discussion that way we'd have a full-blown uh, what trilogy uh, around that final around that final point uh, because to me now what comes I mean a lot of gaps were I think really wonderfully uh, trunk here and I, I I thank you genuinely both of you for doing that but I think where we come this telos redemption of history redemption of materiality and the sort of four points that you were all nodding, so you weren't denying the, the plausibility of them being also the case, you know, that we bring this, we have a discussion around that. And I'm not asking you to solve, you guys to solve the problem of evil. That would be a ridiculously unfair thing to do. But maybe what I'm asking for is what's the connection between the argument that you've made here, and that I, I think I've shown you, I genuinely respect it, and these classical problems. I mean, there's some at least explanation and explanation that I think would be very valuable to hear. Uh, valuable for me and perhaps valuable for your respective listeners as well. Yeah, that, that, that sounds great. Terrific. Yeah, Maybe that was really great. Write another excellent paper. <laughs> I'll try to. I'll do my best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this was really fun and really insightful. John, you brought out my point better than I had, so that's always impressive when you do that and very <laughs> useful to me. It does that often. <laughs> because, because I, I mean, and maybe this is apropos of everything we've said. I'm learning and learning again and learning again and again Socrates' point of following the logos mm. of the argument. Be really willing to follow it. Um, and especially with companions who are also willing to do that too. So that's, that's the, I want to give credit to him uh, for that. So gentlemen, uh, you, we, let's try and set up the, the third um, Dialogos. I think we were genuinely doing Dialogos here. Um, and uh, thank you so much. I, 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 I was looking forward to this all day and it exceeded my expectations. So okay. thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you both. Take care. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.